With the holidays almost here, you don't have time to go to the post office. Traffic, parking, it's going to be packed with everyone mailing holiday gifts and packages. Do what I do. Stay at home with Stamps.com. Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going to the post office during the busy holiday season. Everything you would do with the post office, you can do right from your own desk using your own computer and your own printer. You can print official U.S. postage, too. Print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it. Then the mailman just picks it up. Easy, convenient. I use stamps.com. You should, too. Right now, get this special offer when you use my last name, More M-O-H-R, No Risk Trial. $110 $110 bonus offer. That includes a digital scale and up to $55 free postage. Don't wait. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in my last name, more. Stamps.com. Enter more. Geico presents Fan Mail to a Pig. Dear Maxwell, first off, hope you are well. And I am. Seems like all you do is promote Geico's web and app abilities. And while I really enjoyed your last commercial where you talked about how I could take a photo of my VIN number and add it to my account all via my Geico app, I've got to think it doesn't leave you much time for anything else. Do tell. Sincerely, Miranda Morgan. Well, Miranda, thank you for asking. And this Geico spokespick does have time to do other things. For instance, I do a lot of VIN scanning to add a car. Just to tap away on the Geico app. Put your name on it. Just put your name on it. That's all I say. Be a man or a woman. Put your name on it. Well, I'd like to hear about it, potheads. How the fuck you gonna know how to be great if you don't study greatness? Look at the game change. Donuts. If you wanna battle, with either that you will say yes, world. You know, you're not a bad looking man, Mr. Gals. But you are, Blanche. You are in that chair. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. Hey, man. Yo, turn my headsets up. Joe Perry on the More Stories podcast. Oh, rolling, rolling, rolling. Joe Perry, you're yeah. talking about getting used to the uh, weather here in beautiful Southern California. Well, I'm what, what trying to. I mean, the first day I got here, when the when the book t- tour officially ended, um, there were a couple of nice hot days. You know, where you get two or three hours, and the sun's blasting down, and you get a little, you know, tan. But now. Uh, Along with the, uh, it's actually making it easier to go in the studio. I've been in the studio uh, for the last uh, week or so, so I'm working on my studio tan. But it makes it a lot easier to get in the studio when the sun isn't, you know, blaring down. Because I just love being out in the sun. So, and not a lot of sun uh, at this time of year, like in Boston. Um, it's there, but you don't see it. I mean, you know, there's just clouds. You're not going to get crappy tan weather and stuff. The- but right about now, if, uh, all else being equal, I would probably be in Florida. But Florida? Even then, I mean, if th- I guess they're getting some pretty cold weather down there. It's cold yeah. all over. Yeah. But it's hot all over. If you read Rocks, the book by Joe Perry, My Life In and Out of Aerosmith, uh, I, I wasn't able to read the whole thing. But when I was skimming through, I was like, I started making check marks on pages and like stories and things I wanted to ask you about. It's fucking Stephen Tyler audition for Led Zeppelin. I'm, I'm like, wait, what? Huh? Wait, there's like so much. Your band in particular, Aerosmith. Uh, there is so much. You want to talk about a <clears throat> a band that took a dip, disintegrated, came back. Then when you guys came back, like getting rid of switching out managers and all that stuff. The longevity of Aerosmith. Why? Uh, not to ask like uh, like why, <laughs> but seriously, out of all the bands that disintegrate and then they just say stay disintegrated, what is it about Aerosmith? Not only have you guys survived, but when you guys put songs out, there's never a dud. They are always great songs and they're always hits. It's like this magic potion you guys tapped into somehow after you disintegrated and came back like a phoenix rising from the ashes. It's uh, you guys kind of can't lose. What 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 is that? What do you? I mean, how do you how do you quantify that? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with um, with it, it's always been an uphill fight for us. I mean, we didn't uh, like so called make it overnight. I mean, we worked really hard building the sound of the band and then building uh, a repertoire of songs that people wanted to hear. And uh, but our main thing was. Uh, was 
no one we had to get on stage and entertain the audience live i mean that was that was how you did it back then and uh i mean there were other bands doing the same thing and you just wanted to you know leave the show knowing that you left an impression and that's always been our our thing right up till till right now i mean it's all it's like part of our what, what makes us tick i mean it's it's about getting on stage and playing live and through all the the ups and downs of of like punk and in disco and and uh the diva era and the boy band era and all that stuff i mean it still boils down to playing live and we love doing that and uh Sounds like a cliche, man, but I'll tell you, when, when the five of us get on stage, we leave all the other crap behind, whether it's, uh, you know, a screaming argument or we just had a great time uh, having a lot of laughs. Um, we get on stage and and it's just us in the audience and that's it. So essentially, the longevity of Aerosmith is the fact that when you go see an Aerosmith concert... You never leave that concert feeling like you got shortchanged. You feel the opposite. It, well, it, it's, you you got to destroy live. We try to do. I, I try to leave everything I got on stage, and I'll tell you, the, the more we go on every year that goes by, um, I feel like I got to give more for, at every show. I mean, and uh, we dig down. You can tell all the guys. You know, none of us phone it in. It's just. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know when the next Aerosmith gig is going to be. I really don't. Um, I mean, in the middle of this last tour, uh, Joey had a, a, a medical thing, and uh, he had to go in and have heart surgery. And within 10 days, he was back on the drum throne, you know, feeling like he was 10 years younger. But he just was out there having a great time. And uh, But that's the kind of drive that the band has. So it, It's got to be, I mean... People go like, hey, we're like a family. But it, when you've been around and been together for like 30, 40, however many years Aerosmith has been together, it is your family. You're probably with the band more than you're actually with like your wife, Billy. Like your actual family for a very good chunk of time takes a backseat to your onstage family. Well, one thing um, that when I, when, I, when I met Billy before I put uh, Aerosmith back together with the other guys – um, I mean, we made a commitment that we weren't going to be apart. So I've actually been able to spend probably more time with my wife and with my kids than most average people get to, to do. I mean, a lot of people, they have the nine to five job, you know, they get up early, they, the kids go to school, you know, you get home, you're tired, everybody watches TV or whatever. And then the next day, as far as, uh, we go. We've been. Uh, we raised our kids on the road. We brought a tutor with us, and uh, so I've actually spent a lot more time with my kids. And on a, on the off days, we'll go off and do uh, and wherever wherever we are, we'll we'll try and see something that we've never seen before. Whether it's the Grand Canyon or the biggest ball of twine, uh, you name it, we've been there. <laughs> there is actually you a know, biggest ball of got, twine to we look got, at. Uh, well, there's a couple, there's a, actually. But, uh, you know, we've been across the Everglades. We've uh, uh, the, the kids have been to Tokyo at least six or seven times over the over their lives. And uh, How old are your kids? Um, well, the, the youngest is 22, and he just graduated from BU. Uh, the oldest is 40, and he runs my food company. And uh, on my next youngest Joe is, Perry uh, has a food company? Yeah, it's called uh, Joe Perry's Rock Your World. And we do uh, table sauce and barbecue sauce. And then uh, my uh, third youngest is... Um, let's see, he's, uh, let's see, he's in his late thirties and he's a lawyer and he's married to a beautiful wife who's a lawyer and they live in New York city and they got a two year old daughter. And so that makes You're me a grandfather. a grandfather. And, uh, and then, uh, uh my, uh, 28 year old son is, uh, producer and an engineer and he's got a song uh, three songs in a in a movie at, at con right now and he's he's been on uh uh there was that tv show um um the one about the the actors the kids 
um, I don't know. It, Are you asking anyway, the wrong guy? On, I don't know. They've had some. They've had some songs on some TV shows, and then. Uh, and my youngest is a is a DJ, and he's into electric music and, and that kind of thing. And but he wants to be a um, he's in, he's into the into sound and uh, electronic sound. So we'll see where that goes. But he just graduated from BU, so we'll see where that. My where grandfather that goes. used to tell me you can tell a lot about a man by his children. And for what you're telling me, Joe Perry, you, you, apparently you're a pretty fantastic man. You got all the, all these successful kids and now you got a grandkid running around. Well done, sir. Well, thank you. Um, and actually, I've heard the same thing, that uh, if you just want a window into a family, you uh, watch how the kids behave. And so far, I've been uh, really fortunate. And the kids are, the kids are great. And uh, I have a lot to uh, uh, thank Billy for because she's you know she's a uh, an amazing an amazing woman and uh she's been right there to help with the uh, with the kids you know so when when Aerosmith breaks up and you just said out of your mouth you said when i put Aerosmith back together what, what, were you the one that was the, was the man were you the guy that picked up the call, the phone and called everybody and said like we, we need to get this back together what well i suppose it was kind of uh um I mean, I remember making phone calls to Stephen, but we over the over the the four or five years that I left the band, um, we'd always been t- talking to each other, or, you know. And and in fact, Brad played with uh, with my band a bunch of times. Um, so to actually say who actually made the first phone call, I kind of tend to think it, it's me. But I know that that once that phone call was made, it's kind of like like a give and take thing it took about yeah. three months for us to actually get who was get the last to the domino point. to fall who was Say the, again who was the last domino to fall who was the hardest guy to get to go okay i'm back in i think brad I really think, yeah well he was very very pragmatic about the whole thing and the nicest he, I've, he, I've met all you guys separately and when i was yeah. on saturday night live i met you guys and what, what struck me about brad was like he was the, one of the nicest guys i've ever met in my life he like, is completely he gregarious nice about and it. kind he was, he was really we just nice talked about, about aa it. for like an hour yeah and uh he, he's he's really really nice guy but he just uh you know he he had a good thing going and uh you know outside of the band but he wanted to make sure everything was solid and uh he was he he said well if if you're going to make x amount of dollars a year i'm in you know and uh that was it but in, uh in you the know, book was, rocks that you wrote uh joe perry's book is rocks go get it christmas is coming people make a run on this book because it is an awesome gift and i got news for you joe perry this ain't no little book this is a big ass book you put a lot of work into this oh yeah uh you talk about when the band got back together you got a new manager and the manager that ag- agreed to bring you guys on board it, one of his uh conditions was as long as all of you guys go to rehab well i gotta think hearing that news being in recovery myself, my first reaction would would have been, "Go fuck you, go to rehab. Do you want the band or not? We're Aerosmith. What's well, the matter?" Well, with- if, if the the timeline actually is that he he managed me, he managed my project for over a year before the thought of even going back to to Aerosmith and putting that together was, uh, you know, actually happened and. We partied pretty hard together. I mean, that was one of the things that I mean. He was he was uh, younger, and we we, we uh, you and the manager party. We cranked saying. we we cranked down uh, plenty of uh, plenty of uh, old Jack, and uh, you know, and we had our party sorted out. Sure, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't like it was all of a sudden, you know. It, okay, let's all get straight. It was like. Uh, uh, it was a period of a couple of years before uh, everything got, I mean, we got back together and uh, we were still partying. And during the summer of, uh, that we toured with uh, the Back in the Saddle tour without an album and we just went on the strength of the band being away for five years as as the original members, um, we were still trying to control it, you know, but that there's right. no control in it, so to speak. One of the dreaded uh, seas, you know, and uh, and then uh, it, it was kind of like, you know, we had done a, done a record and it didn't didn't really it didn't really hit the mark, and uh, and he was talking with, with somebody. And he said, "Well, you really got to get these guys 
get these guys, you know, off that party party uh, thing and and get them kind of straight, get them straight, you know, and and he had to deal with it first, you know, yeah, and he, then he got got himself sober, and uh, then then he said to us, you know, like we got to do something different, and we knew it. I mean, I knew after doing some some recording. Uh, um, and it it just wasn't working the way we used to do it, you know. I mean, we had burned out on all that stuff, so uh, we had to figure out a new way to do to do it, and that was sober. It might be uh, going back to the original question. Maybe uh, a, a bunch of guys in a band getting sober at the same time. Maybe that's the longevity because who you know and I know from from being in recovery, like it is in a way like being born again and seeing things for the first time and that that routine that habit of you know you're used to going to a studio wrecked or just getting the right amount of buzz before you do this and you kind of time your high you time your booze to hit certain times of your night and your evening but then you got to relearn just to show up and do it stone cold sober maybe that was the fact that all you guys got sober at the same time that well, that might have been the kick in the ass that that's why we're listening to the great aerosmith we listen to every day oh uh, there's no doubt about it i think that that uh i mean between the the um you know figuring out you know just for ourselves because again you have to do it for yourself and it took a couple of years for everybody to kind of get on board and realize that that was a way to go but um uh could i play without doing anything could I, you know, was it going to affect our fans? I, I know that I could hold up a bottle of Jack Daniels and get a cheer from the audience, you know. I mean, so there was a lot of questions about whether or not to to do it. Uh, but, um, you know, for our, for our image, all that stuff. And then we figured, look, either either take our music with us sober or take us burned out and barely make it, able to make it. So, you know, it was... Uh, it, it got to be an easier choice the more we got into it, and we realized that, um, hey, the fans just want to hear good music, and we realized the only way we could deliver it was to be, was to change our whole paradigm and forget about that because that whole timing thing and all that that worked for a little while, but you know, at the end, it just burns you out, and your yeah. your creativity is just gone, and then you realize that, hey, the first time I heard rock and roll. I wasn't fucked up, you know. I there was, I loved it because it was really, it, you know, I loved it. It wasn't because I had just drunk a bunch of Jack Daniels or smoked a joint or anything. It was all, you know, I was sober when I first heard it and loved it and picked up the guitar and all that stuff. I mean, it wasn't until later that, you know, I discovered the uh, that that it kind of can add a little bit more to it or yeah. whatever. Um, but then, uh, sure enough, you know, farther down the road, if you take it too far, um, you're going to fall off the end. <laughs> well, I thought Back in the Saddle was the first sober Aerosmith album. But this, I didn't know. You just told me it wasn't. What was, what was the actual first album where everybody was sober and everybody had their act together? Uh, permanent Vacation. Okay. So when you're in the studio and the first time you're hearing playback on Permanent Vacation, I'm assuming... You probably have like knots in your stomach because it's the first time you've all jammed together sober, and so you don't know what's going to come back. You might come back sounding like dog shit. Or but when you finally heard that, you guys, was there like an angst to like, how is this going to sound? Well, I think that um, because we had spent uh, enough time working on the record, and we already had had made a record where we weren't straight, you know, um, done with mirrors. Um, appropriately named um <laughs> but uh you know that the the lack of success on that from, from a personal point of view and also from the the fans weren't jumping up and down about that record i mean uh so we already had okay this is how you do it the old way and then when, when permanent vacation when we we're listening back to that it was like music to to our ears so do you think I that mean, actually helped your sobriety in the long run, with like it was almost like an affirmation of like I'm a really great musician without anything in my system other than oh, yeah. the the fire that is like you said the first time you right. heard that record. What was that record, Joe Perry, that you heard back when you were a child that made you go, "Holy shit, I got to be a part of this." What was oh, that man. sound? Um, 
Uh, well, as far as just playing music, it was it was uh, there was like the Roy Orbison um, that era, you know, the early early uh, '60s, late '50s. Just hearing that, hearing music bits and pieces of it. Uh, and there were, really wasn't much music around the house at all. Uh, so it was it was you know what I heard on the radio, and uh, it. I mean, there was something about it that that just grabbed me. And then, um, as time went on, and I heard uh, heard the Beatles, and then I went to see a couple of rock and roll shows. I actually got to see the Dave Clark Five play play live. Wow. You know, I missed the Beatles and the Stones and that that first era, but um, it was one of the last tours that they played, and uh, and I got to see that kind of a. The, you know the last of the English invasion, so to speak, of that English invasion, and uh, uh, the whole thing just kept. The more I got to see, and the, the more I felt like, you know, not only can do I do I like this, but I think I can do something to, with it. You know, I can yeah. I can. Uh, I never thought that it would obviously turn into a forty year old forty forty year career, but. I certainly thought that we could uh, make a living at it, and uh, I wouldn't have to wash dishes. You know, if you got if you could play with any living person, you get a call today on your cell phone when you leave here. They're at the like I don't know. They're at the Roxy tonight. Any living human being, who's the one person, no matter what else you had on your schedule, you would drop everything just to play with that person. Bob Dylan. Really? Oh yeah. Have you played with Dylan before? No. Ah, it I've just seems like you played him. with everybody except you. <laughs> well, I haven't met him. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's there's a perception. You don't strike out me there. as a Dylan guy. That's amazing. There's, you know, there's a perception that you know whatever business you're in, you kind of feel like everybody must know everybody else. You know, and, and the first thing you learn is you don't. You know, right. whatever. As soon as you get into that, uh, you know, whatever whatever part of showbiz you're in, or whatever sp- sports or a- any kind of thing where there's a, like that kind of you know, common clan or whatever. It's like, uh, you know, you run into some people and there's other people you may never get a chance to run into. And, uh, you know, it's just been one of those things. I've never, never had a chance to, to meet them. So. What three songs, if you could pick the playlist for th- you're playing three songs with Bob Dylan live, which three would you pick? Oh, I'd have to say uh, like a Rolling Stone and... Uh, um, let me see. Uh, if I gave you a guitar right now, love, uh-huh. to let me feel your love is okay. one that's uh, it's another one, and also there's one that he did. Uh, um, uh, Broke down engine, which is an old blues song that he did, and uh, I've actually um, we we almost put it on honking on Bobo, but um, it didn't didn't make it. But so if I that, put a guitar a, in your hands, you, you could bang out all those three songs, yeah. no yeah. problem. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> but I'd like to play something that I hadn't heard before. That would make it more interesting. Play something off of Oh Mercy. For some reason, nobody uh, nobody took a swipe at Oh Mercy. It's my favorite Dylan album. Yeah, most of the time. Oh, one of the greatest love songs of all time. I mean, he's written some incredible stuff. I mean. Uh, Anyway, and time out of mind so, late, like coming in at 70 years old and just tossing us time out of mind. You yeah. go, really? And, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, biography, autobiographies, the Chronicles 1. I mean, that's one of the best books I've ever written, period. I mean, forget about autobiographies. I mean, it's just uh, to hear him, you know, write like that and yeah. just uh, and also just the you know what he went through and all that in the early days is, it's amazing well, we want people to buy your book uh, Rocks Joe Perry My Life In and Out of Aerosmith uh, I'm sponsored by Amazon Joe Perry so here's what people need to do instead of going to Amazon you go to my website jmore.com click the Amazon banner and then you can go buy Rocks uh, by Joe Perry My Life In and Out of Aerosmith basically uh, Amazon just wants to know that you got there through my website. And then uh, if you use the Amazon banner at jmore.com, I'll read what you bought uh, on this podcast. Like, uh, look at this guy, Joe Perry. John M. Uh, J. Moores. That's what people call me because that's what Tracy Morgan used to call me. Yeah, what's up, J. Moores? Yeah. <laughs> I'm here with Joe Perry from Aerosmith. Uh, J. Moores, I just used the Amazon banner on jmore.com to be a to buy a five-pound bag of coffee from Coffee Bean Direct. 
I recently quit drinking. Coffee hits the spot. The past few days without alcohol, my body's been saying, hey, man, where's the booze? I just signed up for Amazon Prime. That's why I'll be using your site to shop Amazon all the time. Take care, JJ. You are an inspiration. John M. Uh, I don't know about being an inspiration, John M., but I I try to work hard for a living. Why don't you you blow this guy's mind and just say, hi, John. It's Joe Perry. Hey, John. It's Joe Perry. John. Are we live? No, but he'll get it. Okay. It's uh, it's they, some people are like a year behind. They'll be like, "Yeah, hey, just listen to your podcast with Charlie Sheen." I'm like, "That was in 2011." What? Okay. Um, Geico presents strange savings stories. Jason Ray noticed a blue birthmark had appeared on his forehead in the shape of the Geico gecko. Jason felt compelled to switch his car insurance to Geico and save hundreds of dollars with great discounts. By nightfall, the birthmark had disappeared. Jason's wife, Jeannie, thinks it was probably just blueberry jam from breakfast. Jason prefers to believe otherwise. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Want to add more excitement behind the wheel? Choose Shell V Power Premium Gasoline and experience a drive that comes alive. Shell V Power removes an average of 60% of performance robbing gunk on intake valves left by low quality premium gasolines and it starts with your very first tank. And now you can save big on Shell Fuels. Just sign up free for the Fuel Rewards Network program and receive at least 3 cents per gallon instantly on every fill up. For full offer and details visit fuelrewards.com. Shell V Power Premium. Joe Perry Project, great albums. It, here's this confounds me about uh, lead guitarists. Like when I listen to Keith Richards, "Talk Is Cheap," and when I listen to Ron Wood, "Give Me Some Neck," and Izzy Stradlin, "Juju," I forget the name of the album. Or if I listen to the Joe Perry Project, they're fantastic albums. But for some reason, I think there's a stigma attached to lead guitarists doing like his solo project, and I don't think you guys get nearly the recognition, the run, and certainly not the sales that I think you deserve. Because all these albums that I've just said are like, they're not good, they're great. Like, they're great albums. Oh, you being Joe Perry, when you that. put out a Joe Perry Project album, and if it, I mean, it's obviously not, not selling like an Aerosmith album. Is there is there a part of you that takes it personally where you're at home going like, bro, this is, this is fucking great. What's wrong with everybody? Well... Um, especially the first, the first one. Um, but um, again, there's uh, I, I spell it out pretty clearly in the book. There's actually been no no real interest in uh, seeing me have any success outside of Aerosmith because what would happen if I left again? You know, and uh, there's always been this kind of undercurrent. Um, that I've that I've felt, and I I know from our our managers from the seventies that they were very. Uh, first of all, they didn't really believe that I that I I mattered that much to the band, and so when they left, when I left, they sa- they basically said, "Well, it's not going to make it much difference," you know. Yikes! And then uh, of course we had to take that back after yeah, uh, just a you bit. know a few years later. But, <laughs> what but a you bunch know, of th- there's always been this feeling. Joe Perry left. And, Whatevs. And literally said, you know, um, we want him uh, back. We want him to stay. Come back to Aerosmith. So don't do anything to help his solo career. Really? Simple so you were that. sabotaged a bit. Well, it was. It, when the record came out, I, I get very little uh, push from the record company. But I would think now, especially with the age of like the digital download, yeah. if you did something solo, uh, I, I don't think anybody, I don't think it would be possible to really sabotage it. Is there another Joe Perry solo album in the works? Are you working well, on anything? I'm always, I'm always writing. I've always been. Uh, I mean, it's really been uh, backwards. I mean, I, most people have their, their. Uh, major creative period when they first get started and all but it's just seemed to be the other way and i'm more prolific now than i've ever been and i'm always in the studio i'm working on stuff right now in fact i have have, uh every evening about five o'clock when i'm done with the phoners and all this stuff i'm in the studio so uh for for solo stuff yeah I mean, uh, and then you know what whatever comes out of it uh sometimes it, it may be something I'll say for aerosmith but um but recently, I 
kind of finish this stuff myself and uh and then see where it goes you know um it because uh, i i like to write lyrics and uh and i like to to and some of the lyrics are most of them are, are very personal and i like to sing them you know yeah when you do like joe perry project and you are sort of sandbagged by the record company it's that's it sounds to me like as a fan of you and a fan of both Joe Perry Project stuff that you do on your own and a fan of Aerosmith, it, it sounds almost like it must be a walk of shame to go back to the band. Like, w- was there ever any, like, uh, do, do people get shitty on you? Like, Stephen or, or, you know, anybody go like, how'd that work out for you? Like, no, not at all. I mean, most of them are like, in fact, I've, when my, uh, uh, when the Red Record came out, the Joe Perry Record, uh, we played some songs off of that you know, because uh, I usually sing a couple songs during the show, yeah. and uh, you're and by not to interrupt you, you're one of the few guys. You and Keith are one of the only two. I think the only two guitarists. When it's their turn to sing, everybody doesn't just run to the bathrooms. <laughs> like well, if you're doing you something know. off the Red Record, like I'm staying put because I dig it. And if Keith's gonna sing Happy and Walk Before They Make Me Run, anybody going to the bathroom, you go like, okay, they're not real fans. They're idiots. They're idiots. Right. They don't well, know what's up. Hey man, you know it's just how it is, and it's tough being next next to one of the best singers, arguably, uh, and in, in, you know, so upper the, one, one of the greatest the front men ever. Yeah. And then there's like the the majority of the people are there just to hear the hits. You know the 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 Stephen song and whatever. You know, I mean, I've been nominated for instrumentals and uh, and I have gotten some some critical credit for you know a lot of the, the stuff I've put out. And I do have you know some hardcore fans out there that let me know that. But you know, again, compared to what Aerosmith does, it's a it's a big machine. You know, so. Uh, um, you know, when you don't have, when you have so many people uh, with so much interest in keeping the band together, you know, every time we go out on the road, it's, I mean, there's a lot of cash involved. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, I don't even know if it's, uh, um, uh, I mean, I just expect it to be the way, to, what it is. I mean, I'm not, uh, the, you know, I don't sit there and go, well, I gotta, I gotta have at least three songs that are potential singles or whatever that I just just go down and write songs you know and if there's a if I want to write a love song I write a love song if I want to write a ballad I write a ballad if I want to write a kick-ass rock song I write it it doesn't doesn't I'm not thinking about commercial you know and right, right. uh I mean obviously I wanted to have a a, a standard you know of uh uh, you know, and have it be the best I can I can do, but um, or else again, what's the point of doing it? But uh, it's always I, I'm always pushing myself, and that uh, I think that it helps when I go back to write with Aerosmith because I've learned more, you know, learn yeah. more about writing and and the whole thing. So, you know, I look at it as a positive thing, and uh, whether I sell twenty five records, twenty five thousand, whatever, you know, and. They're permanent. They're, they're they're out there forever. Like the the book, the book is out there. My grandkids' grandkids are going to be reading it, just the way they're going to be listening to my solo records. So, uh, yep, that was granddad, and that's what he did. You know, who makes the set list, and how much time go? Because I get a little set list obsessed when I'm, one of my bands that I dig are on tour and how it changes night to night. Yeah. Like who's who's out of all of you guys? Is there like a driving? force or is it just agreed that we're going to close with x we're going to open with y like who well we usually start the tour off with a kind of an idea of what the set's going to be you know and then we usually practice 10 or 15 more songs we might not have usually played and then um that kind of gets uh morphed into uh Joey likes to to put a set together, and then we have something to work for, from. And then you let uh, the drummer do what, the set list, man. Uh, well, he he, he, he just you know he he sits back and he he has like he says he has the best seat in the house. He gets to watch the audience uh, reaction to the songs. So uh, that's a good point. So you know he he you know he he comes up with a a set that 
you know, he feels like is going to carry the day. And then what's uh, his batting average? And then we uh, what's Joey's batting average? Putting together a set list. Well, it, what I, the the point is, is we start from there, you uh-huh. know, and then we then we kind of like pick out the ones we know we got to play, and we all we all agree on, and then. Um, then it's a battle, and usually our, our road manager, one of our one of our guys, John Vianelli, will take the set list and go from dressing room to dressing room, and then you know we'll go. He'll come to my room, and I'll go. Well, I'd really like to do this one, you know. And then he'll take that to, to Joey's room, and then Joey will either put an X or a Y next to it, and then it goes to Tom's room, and he goes around, you know. And this is crazy. It's this like, is great. It, but you know what? It, it only it, he did that for a while, and then he said, "Listen, let's just go to Stephen's room and get it done all at once." Because you know it gets kind of boring running from room to room, right. and trying to get you know have this one boat, X and Y at a time. You know what I mean? And uh, and so uh, usually we'll get the three of us will get together at some point. You know, whether it's me and Stephen and Joey or. Um, uh, you know, of course, Stephen Stephen's vote carries a little more weight because it depends on how his throat's feeling. Yeah, I was going to say there's probably songs. some songs. Yeah, that you go, hey, we open up with this, we're up and running, and Stephen might go, I can't sing that that early. I got to warm yeah, up. Yeah, okay. definitely. There are there are times when he'll say, well, I can I can do that one, but I got to do a little later in the set. This shit fascinates me. There are a couple me. of songs that. I have to play. Well, there's one song I have to play six string bass. We mentioned it before, uh, back in the saddle, and that's a that's a bitch. I mean, sometimes uh, it's uh, you know it's taken its toll on my hands over the years. I mean, I'm not a bass player, you know. So uh, why doesn't Brad? Sometimes play? I've got to like say, well, I'm not, especially if it's outdoors and it's cold. Well, why doesn't Brad pay, play it? The six string bass. Yeah, it's uh, it's just. Uh, he plays actually. What he does is he plays the solo that I played on the record. So uh, right on because I played the bass on the ba- the six string bass and the solo on the on back on the saddle. So he does my part there, and I play the the bass. So have you ever asked him to switch off because it's killing your hands? Well, it's uh, <laughs> hey, no one wants it. No guitar player wants to play the six string bass, and because it. It's it's a pain. Why not let the basses play bending, the six string bass? Well, because it's a different sound. I know, you know, and it's and it's you got to bend those fucking strings, and they're heavy, and it's a and it's a pain, and uh, you know, so especially outdoors, you know, so um, uh, you know, all those factors go into making the set list. Every time I see a band live, I always try to go two or three nights, and there's always like in the middle. There's maybe four songs in the in the whole show. There's like four songs each night that are switched in and out. And I'm always think, like, because the night before I saw the show and it was incredible. And then all of a sudden uh, you're doing uh, you know toy, something from Toys in the Attic that I've never even heard live before. And I'm going, what? Like, first of all, hey, that's ballsy because I thought that that's like kind of a deep cut. Like, who? It seems odd to me. It's almost like switching horses in the middle of the race. And I think the general fan thinks that once you make that set list, you're just up and running for six months. That's the set list. W- why do things get switched in and out? And then, But then they do get put back in. So I'm curious as to why like some songs on Tuesday night weren't there on Sunday night, and then they get put back in on Thursday. Do you know what, Does that make sense? Well, because sometimes there, there are songs that, that we want to play because they're fun to play. And other times um, it's a... What do they call it when the quarterback uh, makes the call? I mean, Audible, uh, yeah. I mean, very. Uh, a lot of times, I'll just start playing a riff, and I'll look around, and if if Stephen says all right, you know, or one of the other guys, you know, follows in, we'll play it. You know, I mean, a uh, couple of couple of shows before the end, uh, I started playing um, um, moving out and. Then, right after moving out, Joey went right into "Walking the Dog," which is the, the song right after that on the record. You know, so it just kind of was one of those things. I mean, there was no curfew, and I figured, what the fuck, let's play it. And uh, um, that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, arguably, I got the uh, he's got the microphone, but 
I got a loud guitar too, so I can yeah. kind of uh, Who's, you know what's louder, suggest it. Steven screaming or uh, you on an open G? Uh, God, uh, it depends on what we're what we're playing. I mean, if he's uh, <laughs> you know rapping to the audience, they're, they're going to be listening to that. But if I start the chords to uh, 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 again walk this way or uh, um, chip away at the stone. That's a pretty big statement, and it's kind of hard to back away from that with the audience cheering. Yeah. You know? I, I saw you guys. I don't remember the album, and you're going to have to help me, and I apologize. Uh, Joe Perry, the book is Rocks. Uh, go to the Amazon banner, jmore.com, or just buy it because it's awesome, and it's great, and it's the kind of uh, rock and roll insight that you want. A lot of these guys, they write their biographies, their autobiographies, and it's like this corporate bullshit that they would sell at a record store. Joe, I, you he really tells stuff that i was like he, he you really do pull the curtain back warts and all and i commend you for that which tour um so everybody please go buy the book push this book for christmas <laughs> let's let's see how long we can keep joey on the bestseller list that'll be tight uh and he's on twitter at joe perry so if you want to hit him up on uh twitter and hashtag more ears or more stories or whatever let him know that i sent you um, which t- I saw the tour when you guys were with guns and roses which yeah. which which album was that because i can't remember off the top of my head Oh, God, I can't remember either. It was, uh, I don't know, the end of... Uh... Go ahead, Mama. Vacation oh, that was Permanent, va- permanent Vacation and Pump? Okay. okay. So here's the thing that I always wanted to know. When you guys started that tour, you had the number one album uh, in the country, and Guns N' Roses was like... They were, they were Guns N' Roses. They were still a powerhouse, but you guys had like the number one album. But then the, the, you guys kind of flip-flopped on the uh, charts. Yeah. So that's got to be kind of a weird dynamic when the band opening for you all of a sudden shoots up the charts and passes you. Well, it's it was great to to watch watch them go through that, you know, coming from cuz the buzz was on already about the band. But be honest, you did know? they become like I mean, and Axel's not known as a sweetie. Were they kind of like dicks after that or were they Well, st- actually they were really they were really together for the for that tour. I mean, I think they were only late uh, one show, they were half an hour late, and uh, I know they had, they had one argument or something. But but all in all, as far as an opening act, they were, they were great. They put on a good show for the for the for the crowd. But they already had the buzz on, you know what I mean. And they were the they were the new big thing. And uh, we'd seen so many new big things go by that it was kind of like. Yeah, I can stand back and go, oh God, well, here's this other band in there. God, they they even say that they that they're influenced by us, and here they are, you know, selling more records than us by the end of the tour. But you know, I, I'm standing back and having you know so many years in the business, it was kind of. I just remember what it was like when when we had that change when we went from you know playing clubs where, where the only people were the people you your friends that you called up you know come on down we're playing tonight you know could you come up to the show and then then you you kind of move into that place where it, it doesn't feel like you're pushing rope uphill right. you know i mean people are coming to the show because they like your your band and and that's a special feeling that that you can't it never it never feels like that again and to watch guns and roses go through that you know i mean it was like a that summer they exploded and to watch that happen was great you know i mean uh, as far as aerosmith it's kind of like just like with the with the run dmc thing i mean we we did that for the fun of it and you know we didn't know where it was going to go and we were we were touring putting out records you know we're going to do what we're going to do it just happened to be one of those things that 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 really made a big impression and and helped us out but we didn't really plan it that way. Uh, nobody from the record company planned it that way. It was just an idea that everybody Rick, thought it'd be Rick like a good Ruben gag, had, you know. MTV, Aerosmith, Run DMC, it'll be hilarious. And it's all of a sudden the money starts rolling in for the record well, company, and you go, it, "Oh, this isn't hilarious at all. This is big business." This is it, now, well, we gotta, now we now we got to take these three guys on tour with us. Well, it turned out that uh, also a lot of musicians uh, decided that that uh, having. Uh, uh, that kind of funk and, and that kind of feel with some electric guitars on it was a pretty good thing. It almost started another genre, you know. Yeah. But we had, we really you didn't, guys had the funk from the beginning. Didn't though. know 
where it was going to go from there. In fact, we didn't know if it was even going on the record, you know, because they didn't they didn't want guitars on it. I mean, they had their own thing. They were doing rap. I mean, they had a new thing going. It was it was you know their thing. And and uh, when Rick said you know well maybe we should put some guitars on there and uh, they they weren't like uh, jumping up and down going yay you know what I mean it was like. You know, we we hung out in the, in the studio, and Rick was pushing it, and uh, and we had fun doing it. And it, he said, "Look, I don't know if we're going to put it on the record. We'll have to talk about it some more." But sure enough, three weeks later, we got a phone call, and they said, uh, "Do you want to be in the video? It's going to go on the record." And uh, and it turned out to be a a, a big uh, a big deal. Yeah, a real big deal. Uh, has ever been a band? That was actually hard to follow. Yeah, we had a couple of, and I, again, I talk about it in uh, in the book. There was a couple of uh, instances where where we got nailed fair and square. Um, there was one. Uh, in fact, there's a, um, a thing about it in uh, classic rock. I think about Rory Gallagher, um, who's not with us anymore. And he's a great. He was a great guitar player, Irish. Hard drinking, hard playing blues blues rock guitar player, and we played with him at um, I think it was a uh, in Central Park one of the outdoor gigs, and he opened for us, and the audience just wouldn't let him off the stage. He was rocking, and he just kept building building the show, and it, it hey man, they blew it. He he blew us off the stage that night. They, when what year was that? Uh, Probably in the in the mid seventies. I mean, mid to late seventies. And uh, there was just something about his. Uh, I mean, he had a, a real solid following in New York, and uh, it was a, one of those big festivals. And he just just was on. He was on that night, man. And uh, I love how you put it, though. And Joe. we were just getting. He getting nailed us there, fair you know? and square. I yeah. love how you just put it like straight up. Couldn't follow him. Or yeah. you, I mean, you followed him, but it was tough. Yeah. And, and how. Is it like, you know, one verse into the first song we realize, uh oh, we're in trouble? Or is it like uh, halfway through the set? Like, wh- well, when do you realize, like, we wow. couldn't, uh, I mean, uh, we were still still building our, our, our following in New York at that point. You know what I mean? It was, uh, uh, it may, it may have been one of the first times we headlined a big show like that. I, I can't remember, but, uh, but, uh, it, it, Regardless, it was, uh, you know, it was still like you get on stage, you do your best, and, you know, hopefully you come away with the audience remembering what you did. That night, I don't even know if they knew what songs he was playing. He just had this the presence on stage. He was he was ripping it up on guitar, and uh, the audience loved it. And we, we kind of, uh, you know, went on, and it wasn't, we, we realized that the, the crowd wasn't, as with us as you know we would have liked and uh you know like i said it was uh you know we got beat beat fair and square <laughs> i love it I, I just love the way you put it too but you what you said just now that i found really interesting well, i'm want... gonna jive and say you know well he was really good and we did okay and our audience was my like, pants were too tight so i wasn't into show, it that man. night no. they, <laughs> they, 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 it was one of those times that uh you know they, he really, the band was really good, man. And, well, that's and why I brought I, I mean, it. Yeah, you know? I, I brought it up because in the book, it's like you, you're, you're just super honest in it, and um, you brought up Dylan, and we know now, and uh, you know through this discussion so far that you were always in the studio, you were always writing, you always like to write, you like doing lyrics, and obviously on guitar, you're you're peerless, like you're just you're Joe Perry. It, I got to imagine. There's got to be a little part of Joe Perry that would love to just kind of like with the sunglasses and the hat and just maybe get a Mustang convertible and just without anybody else in the band knowing, just drive from like San Diego to Seattle and back, just go up and down the coast and do like, you know, 150 seat rooms, maybe take a couple grand and just drive around like it, like the old troubadour hoofing well, it. Like that's I did that for, for almost five years with the project. 
I mean, that was pretty much it. I mean, we loaded but that's, up. But you with the project. I'm saying yeah. just you, like you, because you said Dylan is why I brought it up. Yeah. Like you just go up, you can go acoustic, you can plug in, just like bars in Redondo Beach where they go, hey, we, uh, oh, there's a band coming out. And then it's, uh, it's fucking Joe Perry. And you just do, you can just do Dylan covers. You can do whatever you want. Well, like could, there's something that about that. that it would, right? Riot, you know, it's, it's one of those things that would be, uh, um, I could definitely, definitely do it. I mean, I've got enough, uh, enough stuff that I like to do, and and uh, you know, I've thought about even you know, what it would sound like to just interpret some of the Aerosmith songs. You know, that's yeah, like sings, no, no know? t-shirts, no merch, anything. no like yeah. this Friday at the Malibu yeah. Inn. No, just the, everybody's eating their dinner, and you look up, and Joe Perry's on stage playing Masters of War. Well, it would be a riot. I just let me know that. if it happens. Cause I want you know, to be there. Just let me know if it ever goes down. About that, because that's that. You know, I mean, uh, I have a couple of months coming up. You just gotta <laughs> let me know. If, oh, look, he's, Joe's Joe's got that look in his eye, like mm, Malibu in ain't too bad. I can jump in the ocean when I'm done. Yeah. Um, Stephen really auditioned for Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I guess that's uh, that's what uh, that's what it said in the paper. And that's what Jimmy said. You know. But is that what, I mean, does Steven tell you, like, I'm going to audition for Led no, Zeppelin? No. Or does he keep it a secret? And does that no. harbor resentment at the time of like, bro, what, what are you doing? We got this thing going over here. Well, that was, that was the conversation two months later yeah. um, after, he, you know, we talked again. I mean, uh, it was kind of like, uh, well, the thing was is that we were, we were, writing for the new record you know and it was like i finally said look man why don't we just go back and do it the way we used to you know just sit on the drums play guitar turn on the tape recorder and we'll just see what happens so after five hours of doing that on a friday and uh um i said well what about he said this was great i had a great time let's do it monday and i said uh or I said, let's do it Monday. I'm always down here anyway. Come on. And uh, and he said, well, I'll call you tomorrow. And uh, no phone call. No phone call this on Steven Sunday. No said call on, tomorrow, right? phone call on, on Steven Tuesday. said this? I'll call you yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, you know, I'm typical. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> no phone call. And Lead then, singer uh, syndrome, man. And then... Uh, um, I asked one of the one of the cats that was, uh, you know, and he said... Uh, Oh yeah, didn't you know he flew to flew to England on Saturday to to audition for Led Zeppelin? And it was like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? It was uh, uh, after you know. I mean, he had to know when we were talking about uh, you know writing again that he was going to to yeah. to, uh, to London. But you know, I never really you know got into it with him as far as that goes. But uh, bottom line was uh, you know. He was he was off, and uh, but how weird is it? He didn't pass his audition for Led Zeppelin. You could hold that over his head I don't for the know rest what of time. The story is you Joe. Know? Next time he wants to play with the set list, you go. We could have it your way, or you could just go. Uh, not get into Led Zeppelin again. Uh, well, that <laughs> believe me, that that's I've used that plenty of times. I mean, come on. I've when I was writing the book, it was like you know we'd be doing an interview, and if you started. You know, going off a little, I, I tell him, hey, Stephen, I'm writing a book right now, man. And, uh, or, you know, I'm, I'm looking through the pictures right now for the book. So uh, watch what you, you know. Isn't it amazing that, like, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant just can't get their shit together? I mean, now they've played a couple gigs together, but, like, Jimmy Page would rather tour with the Black Crows. Than yeah, even just get together. I, with, I, I mean, you talk he, about a band disintegrating. Like those guys, they can't. I mean, well, Steven in, Tyler. What do you mean you don't know? Steven Tyler auditioned for Led Zeppelin. Well, Robert Plant's alive. They're English, man. They just don't talk. I mean, um, one thing I've noticed about English people is, and mostly, well, you know, I know mostly musicians, but they just uh, they, they're very reserved and they're very quiet about their about stuff and. At least Stephen and I talk. I mean, we, there's a, like a good give and take, and I mean, we have good days and bad days and stuff. I mean, but uh, I mean, when I talk talk to to Jimmy about it, it's just uh, they just don't talk. You know, literally. I mean, it's 
So it's it's kind of like uh, I, don't, I don't know me. what it is. I don't know what what was in the past. Whatever. All I know is that that, that they're really like. Uh, I mean, Stephen and I are like you know. Uh, uh, big time buddies compared to the way that, that uh, Robert and, uh, and and Jimmy are. And, but uh, look, Stephen, I understand like the whole culture of the Brits not talking to each other and being staid and reserved. But I would think like Stephen leaving from Logan Airport to fly seven hours to London to then get in a cab and drive on the wrong side of the street to get to an, a, a hotel and then to go to an audition is probably a lot more legwork than Jimmy going. Robert, would you like to record some more? I like, suppose. Th- that's a lot of work to not talk to Robert Plant. You know what? I just hear <laughs> stuff secondhand. And, Joe you know, does not want any part of the Zeppelin I, conversation. I, I, don't, I really, you know, again, I don't want to, like, you know, pass you on stuff that I don't know. Sure. That I wasn't sitting there for. Sure. You know what I mean? It's like uh, you, can, you can tell by the book. It's like, right. you know, unless I was, like, kind of there or I – Read it in the paper, or there was something, uh, something to, to, to back it up. I mean, uh, but, but I, Stephen I don't did. Put it, just put words I, in other I'm not going to lead mouths. you down any more Led Zeppelin alleys. But but Stephen did indeed audition for Led Zeppelin. Th- this is true. Okay. Yeah. And where were you when you found out that Stephen was on American Idol? No, I was. Did oh, he call I'm, you and tell you he was going to do it? No. I know this is in the book, right. but that's why I'm asking you specifically. Right. No, I, 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 I don't want it. the listener to think I'm sabotaging you. Like, why is no, he no, fucking jumping I, all over Joe's shit? This I is mean, all very much in the book. I'm telling you, there's, a, there's oh, I know. detail that's, and yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. in there, That's why too, I'm leading but, you down these roads. But uh, as far as that goes, I'm trying to remember. We were on the road, and uh, somebody said something about Tyler's doing, doing American Idol. And, and uh, I'm guessing your first reaction was, which song? Like probably, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, is, what song no, will he no, do? It was, it was definitely he was gonna. He was picked as a you know they wanted him to be a judge because I had been on the show two or three times before that you know like backing up a couple of different different singers just for the just for the fun of it you know what I mean? Uh, they just they asked me to, to to play guitar with this one or that one and I, and I, so I'd been on the show before, but uh, you know not asked to be a, a judge which is a whole different it's a full time that's a, that's a tv thing, gig, you know man, yeah. and so uh you know um anyway i just uh found out somewhere on the on the road some somebody had read it on the on the internet and uh and then there was uh i don't know a couple of days went by finally i just took him by the arm went in the Went in the bathroom and said, "What's going on, man? You know, which is how we deal with stuff. You know, when when shit really hits the fan, it's like you know, it's like we just I just throw everybody out of the dressing room and and we just have a, a talk and see what's going on, you know, and uh, sort it out. And uh, you know, uh, that's that's pretty much how we've been able did to he, make it did, work. Do you think he did it? I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of your brother, but." Was it just the check that you just can't turn down? Do you, did he do it with the mag, being magnanimous, thinking like this will help the overall brand of Aerosmith? Were the guys well, in the I band think, thinking this is going to take away from the brand of Aerosmith? Well, I think that that was, you know, I, I think he's probably used every every uh, you know kind of uh, justification for doing it. But the bottom line is, I think that that it was. Um, uh, it was really custom made for the the guy's the guy's personality. He's he's like outgoing. He loves the cheer from the from the audience. He loves being the center of attention. He loves the all the press. He loves all that stuff. And, and he makes no bones about it. From the time he was six years old, he always wanted to be a big star and be a celebrity. And it was it was one of those things. It was like it was they, it was an empty chair there for that kind of a character, you know. Um, and it it worked perfect for him. I mean, it was a it was a good gig. We were happy for him after we got over the the fact that you know um, we realized that the actual time he was going to be away from the band was actually pretty short. It was only. Uh, what a uh, couple of months? I mean, when you uh, add up the, he has to do that uh, stuff where they do the uh, the semifinals. It takes yeah. a month. They go around and they do the the auditions, and then there's uh, there's really like a month or a month and a half where they're actually doing it live, 
because the first half of the season is showing the semifinals. As so, a fan of Aerosmith, when I first found out Steven Tyler was going to be on American Idol, I thought the brand, because it is a brand, Aerosmith, yeah. and one of the greatest uh, logos ever. I mean, just it's like well, it's, it should be a cattle prod. It's just it's <laughs> too good. Um, my first thing was like, oh, this is this is kind of going to be weird for Aerosmith. Well, hey, man. Or did it just make everything go up because of the visibility of being on primetime television? I think it, it kind of even, everything came out even, I think. I think okay. that there was certainly people that did, um, uh, more people knew, knew Stephen's name, knew the band's name, but it doesn't make them... Uh, Buy buy tickets. That's right. Yeah, no, it doesn't yeah. make yeah. the song any better. You know, whatever song's coming out, it doesn't. You know, all of a sudden, it's like, oh yeah, he's on American Idol. So that so was this his. Song must that was his Joe better. Perry project. So it, it was right. right. So that's his Joe Perry. That's he, his red. He did it, and okay. it was great. And uh, you know, then uh, um, I don't know whatever happened. You know, with the second year, and you know, the third year. It, I mean, he was signed up for three years. They did. He did two and. It is what it is, but anyway, it was, uh, you know, we were happy for him, and uh, it just, uh, uh, I don't know, as far as the image of the band, I think, you know, I don't think it was something he would have done back in the 70s, unless it was it was the money, but we didn't really need the money back then, and uh, not that he needed the money now, but uh, um, I really don't, you know, we were too... too too arrogant, too rebellious, too much. There was too much of the image that did. I don't think that he would have done it. It would, you know, it would be like kind of going on. Uh, I don't know. There was too much of that. Uh, don't trust anyone over thirty vibe going yeah. on in the band to Ooh. to make it. But uh, you know what? Second guessing Stephen never happened. It could, does he always me. prove to usually be right? Is that why? Or no, is it, always, it's a well, fool's errand to second. No, no matter what, I think he's going to think. It's probably going to be just the opposite. So, really? No matter what. I mean, <laughs> I've, it's uh, just uh, just how it is. Joe Perry, uh, the book is Rocks, My Life In and Out of Aerosmith. Uh, by the way, way more photos than any other uh, person's uh, rock and roll autobiography. And all like really cool, old school. You as a child holding a guitar. A little handsome Joe Perry. A little young man Joe Perry. Well, All the way through. Um, uh, so I just want everybody to get this book because out of all, look, uh, two years ago it was Keith's. Uh, I, I dug Keith's a lot. I thought that was cool. And uh, since then I'm like, well, where's the next one? Boom. Here it is. It's well, Joe Perry. Thanks. It's, I really appreciate that because that was, uh, that, Keith's was definitely one of the ones that stood out. And I read a lot of them before uh, I started with this one. And uh, Keith's was definitely Definitely, uh, it really hit things on the mark, you know. I like the one story in Keith's is when him and uh, him and Paul McCartney didn't know they were neighbors, and like I think it was like Turks Caicos or something. They were on the beach and they lived four houses down from each other, but they didn't know it. And then so Paul heard that Keith lived down the beach, so he just walked and kept looking into people's houses. <laughs> and then when he found Keith's house, they just hooked up and they smoked a joint and they just started playing together. But it was the first time. Paul's a lefty, as you know. Yeah. Keith, and, and this blew my mind. Keith has never been able to sit across from somebody and look at their hands, but because Paul was a lefty, he was actually able to look right, direct right. ahead instead of sitting next to the guy and getting right. a damn stiff neck. That yeah. story made me so happy. Well, but yours. Things, things uh, like that happened, you know what I mean? It's I thought like, yours was uh, Keith, I thought, you know, Keith speaks kind of Keith. Yeah. Uh, language and he is a bit of a pirate your yours is uh way more informative and a lot more linear as to how the guys came together uh the fights within the band the disintegration the rebuilding the you know stuff like that so uh, just congrats and uh I, I wrote a couple books and i know what you're talking about when it like your grandkids are going to read it when you look on the inside flap joe and it says Library of Congress, and you're like, wait, what? I barely get out of high school. I know, there's a lot of Library stuff of that Congress. goes with it, man. It's crazy. It's like, it's like definitely, uh, I mean, I suppose if you're a, a writer and, and, you know, like a lot of that stuff is like, uh, it's again, like doing an album. There are a lot of things you look at and you see that it's, you know, registered here and all that, uh, trademark there. And so a lot of the stuff to the to me, you know, it just... Uh, 
you know, it didn't really have the same impact. But certainly, when the first box came with with the the four books in it that were actually that book, which was only about two weeks before it went on sale, because you know you you do it in pieces. You know, you got yeah. you got to worry about the cover, you got to worry about the pictures, you got to worry about you know the edits. I mean, we went edited it five times, I think. You know, just how to, many to stories had right. to get edited out because members of Aerosmith said, "No way are you putting that story." In oh the no, book. I didn't talk to the guys in the band at all about so, the book. All right, so then the next question is, who was the first guy in the band to go? How did how could you put that in your book about me, dude? No, I didn't get any of that. Really? From anybody? Um, it's like the no. most functional family. What? Ever. Like, you guys are like the most functionable, not dysfunctional. Like It just seems like you guys... Well, I got the response that I kind of expected from everybody, you know, um, just because just I know the guy so well. And, and you know, um, it just, uh, <laughs> I really have to say, I mean, everybody just kind of uh, followed what, 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 kind of what I figured it would be. Of course, Tom... Tom didn't get back to me for a month, um, <laughs> but Tom is... Maybe he was auditioning for Led Zeppelin. He Apple. actually he read, read the book, and he just had it just kind of forgot about texting me about it. But then when he finally did, he, he said it, it was really, really good, and thanks, you know, he really liked, about, liked the part about uh, Frank Conley, you know, our first manager, and... Uh, because that was a really special time for all of us, and uh, and and we really worked hard to nail that. And uh, and he had just there was like one minor comment in there because Frank gave us those nicknames, and um, and he had another nickname that was uh, um, that Stephen had come up with, and uh, uh, his his Frank's name for him was called the Brain. And Stephen's name was Logier, which was, to me, more appropriate because I look at it like a real positive thing because he was always, he's always been like the solid, the solid guy, you know what I mean? He doesn't come up with like, like just uh, uh, answers to questions or whatever without giving it some thought. And, you know, like he, he was always like the the most pragmatic of, oh, of the of the and and he took it know, as an insult and really smart too i'm not you know that's the thing i mean yeah. this the the brain was a good name for him because he, he is really smart but um but as far as like uh you know like having like the i mean just the low-end torque to like keep the thing going was, he didn't like was, his nickname well, he he wished I would have said the brain instead of the low gear. <laughs> if that's but the that biggest, if that's the biggest know? battle after a tell-all, well, I'll, I'll fix it in the next, 35, 38 next years thing, in Aerosmith. Yeah. Then you've done okay. Yeah. Last question, Joe Perry uh, at Joe Perry on Twitter, um, and let him know uh, that you bought the book. Tweet a photo of you holding the book and send it to Joe Perry on Twitter. I'm sure that'd be a nice day for Joe Perry. Wakes up, looks at Twitter, goes, oh, "I'm checked Twitter in four days." Boom, there's 800 <laughs> people holding the Joe Perry book all over the world. Uh, you have a magic wand. You can put any band that's broken up back together. Which oh, band man. do you pick? Uh, the Jimi Hendrix Experience. <laughs> have you ever been? Oh, yeah. I Electric mean, Ladyland, uh, baby. Let's it, get after it. It would have to be a magic wand, that's for sure. A long one. If it was Jimmy's, it was a long wand. Yeah, but I'll if tell you. catch my drift. He's the Amadeus of this century, man. So, uh, I mean. That's your guy. That's your touchstone. Just like that. that oh, you know. That's a great. You know what? I don't, nobody could argue that. Jimmy Hendrix experience. Let's get them back together. We'll have to have a seance. Yeah. Maybe we could pull it off. I'll be the first one there. Joe Perry, uh, rocks my life in and out of Aerosmith. Really pleasure to meet you, man. Great. And um, just what a fan for so it's long. Good talking to you, man. I appreciate it, brother. Much love. This is More Stories. Joe Perry, thank you. Sure. Put your name on it. Thank you.